Hi, everybody. I'm Diane Brady. I am here with Aloe Black, who, of course, we know as the Grammy-nominated recording artist, singer, songwriter, also activist. Aloe, you're an entrepreneur. Let's start with that, because you and I met at Founders Forum not long ago where you were talking about Major Inc. I'm so intrigued by this business named after your dad. But talk about the genesis of that, and welcome. Hi. Thank you so much. Great to be here. Um, yeah, I named Major Inc. after my dad because... You know, my dad retired from the United States Marine Corps uh, for after 30 years of service, and he just uh, epitomizes a can-do-anything type of mentality. So I named my company that because I want my company to be able to do anything when it comes to um, curing infectious disease and creating uh, solutions for major problems. And I was lucky enough to find some brilliant professors at the University of Houston, Dr. Bin Guo and Dr. Gomika Urugamasoria, who work in a special class of molecules called peptoids. Mm -hmm. And not many people know about peptoids, but I'm so excited about it. I feel like we're in a mRNA 15 years ago situation where it's, it's just a burgeoning kind of new uh, technology and people are becoming aware and I'm trying to, to share as much as I can, but we found that peptoids can have an impact in infectious disease, in longevity, in um, arthritis, and potentially in sepsis is the most recent indication that we found, which is uh, groundbreaking because, you know, sepsis is a major killer in hospitals and yeah. we don't have a cure for it. Yeah, no, it it's, uh, killed some of my family members, so I, I think that's very exciting. One of the things that intrigues me is how did you come to this from an entrepreneurial perspective? Because some people would give money to it, you know, from a charitable perspective, but you are building a company around this. So was it inspired by COVID or what yeah. brought you to well, it? Well, believe me, I tried I tried to do the uh, the, the philanthropic uh, pr um, direction, but I quickly realized that it is almost impossible to do biotech as a philanthropy. Uh, even when you get to the regulators, uh, they want to mm. know what your business plan is. How will you commercialize this drug and make it available and sustainable? Why should we even give you an approval to, uh, to deliver it to humans if you can't sustain it? So... I had to pivot from philanthropy to founder. And I ultimately had been vaccinated and boosted, but I still fell victim to COVID. And mm. I wanted to find a prophylactic solution, something that could prevent the disease rather than just boost my immune system. And I had an idea. I looked it up in Google and I found, I found the paper uh, that was uh, published by these uh, amazing scientists at the School of Pharmacology at Houston and I contacted them and they didn't they didn't believe that was really that was said, really me Aloe first. Black they, calling I'd like to support your research <laughs> how, yeah how did they react to that they they held off on responding for a couple of weeks until one of the scientists thought uh, uh, asked his daughter to, to vet the email for him and she said well you know it seems real look his assistant's name is there with his website so maybe that's just try it and I had a fat conversation with them, went to go meet them in Houston. And since then, we've been off to the races. We, we did some really significant uh, proof of concept work. I sponsored some research that was successful. And then they just kept showing me more and more um, patents that they had for other indications. And I just started realizing this is not a COVID solution. This is a platform company for multiple indications. and. I'm going to do my very best to help you translate from bench to bedside. It's interesting because being a founder, obviously you're not doing a lot of the cutting edge research. So talk about what is your involvement in the company? How has it evolved? Because it's clear you're doing more than giving them money. Yeah, well, it starts with um, operations. Someone has to make all the phone calls. Uh, someone has to cut all the checks uh, and and continue you're making to phone push calls forward i'm sorry you're making phone calls i do make phone calls i yeah. i've i've found myself squarely positioned in this business um almost on a full-time basis i still make music mm. but um music is sort of on autopilot and this is has taken uh m my interest I, i'm super super passionate about what is possible with this uh, company and this new class of molecules 
It's interesting because we talk so much about the influence of AI in healthcare. Is that is technology really helping to drive this at this moment in time? I know certainly COVID has raised attention to this class of drugs, but what are some of the other factors that have made this the perfect moment to be doing it? What's interesting is that um, my investigators have engaged a, a strategy and a methodology that predates AI, um, and their system at this point is still better than AI. Hmm. We believe that if we work with the right technologists, we can find ways for AI to aid us, but um, they've turned drug discovery on its head in, in, a, in a fantastic way. Um, and I know that AI will be helpful, but for now, the system that we use is really robust. I mean, they tell me two days. I like to, I like to say it's about a week to discover the proper candidate for any said indication, which is way different from the, the timeline in traditional drug discovery. Well, that, you mentioned an interesting point, which is that the speed of innovation and the speed of regulation are very different. So what have you discovered about this whole process with, you mentioned the FDA, where are you in it and uh, any thoughts of yeah. how it can improve? What I've discovered is that there is an education process. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, with mRNA, regulators didn't know about it, investors didn't know about it, and many scientists didn't know about it. Um, the ones who did, who were working on it, understood the potential, but it took years to get into the clinic, to, to get first in human. Um, and I find myself speaking to pharmacologists at the FDA, um, the government grant institutions, uh, BARDA, ARPA-H, NIH, and NIAD, I'm talking to investors across mm -hmm. the, the biotech spectrum, and they are all now just learning, really learning about what peptoids are capable of. And so I find that the speed of, of innovation, the speed of regulatory uh, approvals really comes down to an education process. And there's so much that needs to be done to validate what we're doing. But what we see in the lab and in in vivo is so uh, convincing that I hope that with the proper funding, we can do the, the uh, battery of tests that will convince anybody. So you mentioned that this is taking up a lot of your time. You're still doing the projects as recording ours. Has it influenced your outlook or your approach to music in any way? Oh, um, I don't know that it's influenced my outlook on music. It has influenced my approach. Um, you know, having a little bit of celebrity and songs that people know offers me the opportunity to make any phone call, almost get into any room. So mm -hmm. that's been that's been wonderful. Um, it makes me want to uh, make a couple more hit songs so that I can uh, have even more outsized impact on the business, the, the business side of the business, the networking side of the business, the fundraising mm -hmm. side of the business. Um, and I think it's I think it's you know, it's helped so far. I think it's going to be even even uh, more um, advantageous to have a couple more uh, hits under my belt. You know, I want to step back a sec, because one thing that's always fascinated me about you is you're such a renaissance man. Even the fact that you started your music career and then you went to University of Southern California and you did what, linguistics, I believe, in psychology? I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, 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 Talk, talk, and then you worked at EY. Like you've got such a fascinating background, and what inspired that? Because you were on a track making music. What made you stop, or not, or not hit pause? You continued to do it. What made you decide to pursue the degree? So I've I've always been um, an academician. My parents are immigrants from Panama. They were very, very. Um, uh, adamant that I do well in school and I go to college. And so I did really well in high school, but while I was in high school, I was also making hip hop music. I was an artist, I was recording, you know, mm -hmm. the garage band kind of thing that a lot of high schoolers do. It was always a hobby, never thought of it as a career. Did really well in high school, got a full ride to USC, um, and did really well at, at uni university. Uh, you know, went to the Annenberg School of Communication, but then wasn't enough. I wanted to do a neuroscience major, but they didn't have it. So I 
was able to do a second major that was kind of interdisciplinary. I got to put together the classes that I wanted. Spent a, a summer in uh, Michael Thompson's neuroscience lab, you know, working mm -hmm. on uh, localizing memory in the inner positive nucleus, and and was fascinated by science. But I had also an internship with Ernst and Young in mm -hmm. the summers. And so when I graduated, sort of the easy thing to do was to walk into that job at Ernst & Young as a consultant, which was yeah. great because it gave me, um, you know, sort of an, an acumen and, and a vernacular around corporate America um, um, that I don't think I would have had otherwise if I'd stayed in the academy and just done science or something like that. Um, and a couple of years into my Ernst & Young uh, stint, I was laid off. But before that happened, there was there was an, uh, an, an amazing moment where they had an annual um, meeting and all of the new hires had to, there was like a hazing process. All the new, new hires had to tell a poem or, or a story or sing a song or do some sort of interpretive dance. And I decided I'd sing a song. And this is before I be, really became a singer. I was still a, yeah. a hip hop artist, but I'd, I'd written a song that um, was called Mama Hold My Hand about the relationship of mother son. And after I got off stage, uh, standing ovation, and one of the partners at the firm came up to me and he goes, kid, I think you might be in the wrong business. <laughs> oh, that's and, uh, influential. That's very, that's very funny. The, I wonder I if you go back right, and, you know. you know, they have these big, huge events like the Strategic Growth Forum. They'll be lucky to have you back as uh, one of their major artists, I'm sure, to perform. Oh, but, I'm sure it'll uh, happen. Um, let me ask a little bit about some of the other projects you're doing because you're also, I know you've been quite an activist and everything, criminal justice reform, malaria. What are you working on now on that front or is that on pause? So on the front of activism and uh, philanthropy. So I've been working with organizations like um, Stand Together, who it's a conglomerate of organizations that are, are sponsored within Stand Together. In the criminal uh, ref justice reform area, they were really helpful in, help in getting um, an, an op-ed in the USA Today on qualified immunity. Mm -hmm. um, qualified immunity was what I felt was really important piece of reform in our justice system. It is a, a doctrine at the Supreme Court that basically offers immunity for any egregious uh, uh, violations of civil rights that are that occur from a federal side, and it trickles down to state and and local police. Mm -hmm. They basically qualify lawmaker, uh, the police, and and uh, agents of the state or government to be immune from accountability, and that I felt was. Um, a cultural um, uh, poison for for law enforcement because yeah. it offers the op opportunity for uh, the God complex to say, well, you know, I'm above the law. I don't have to worry because if I do something bad, I can't get sued. And if someone tries to sue me, the judge will throw it out because they know that their higher courts will will say will point to qualified immunity. This doctrine at the yeah. Supreme Court. So I thought um, I thought it was important to spread the word so that citizens, voting citizens, knew about it, um, so that we could influence our lawmakers to to push to transform uh, this this the law, the civil rights statute under which qualified immunity is has was or the civil rights statute was perverted that allowed allowed this immunity. Um, and you know there are there are state measures as well, so it's not just looking at the federal piece you know many states have their own measure of of immunity and um i just think it's important for for everyone to be held accountable for things they do when they're doing it wrong especially when they're um under color of law 100 percent. i think it's been such a major issue obviously you know george floyd pre and post um so good for mm -hmm. you that's amazing work before we got on the call you mentioned other projects on anything on your radar you want to put on ours here right now? Yes, I, I, okay, so as an activist and a philanthropist, I also get involved in, in using my voice in the best way that I can as an, as an artist, and I write songs for nonprofit organizations. I want to create sonic legacies that can help amplify these organizations, and I re recently released a song in collaboration with Big Brothers, Big Sisters of America, 
called Never Let You Down. It's a really fun song. And, and obviously the concept is, you know, as mentors, mentoring young uh, people in the, in the country, um, the idea is to, to show them that you'll never let them down. I've never heard that term, sonic legacy. I like that. You know, when you sit back and you knit is, is, all these together, I'm thinking of the connective tissue of, of the portfolio of your life that right now is aloe black. Do you see links in terms of what motivates you and the impact you want to make? Ha, huh, yes. And I've synthesized it down to what I call AIM. It stands for Affirmation, Inspiration, and Motivation. Hmm. I want to use my music to be the soundtrack to people living their best lives. I want to use my um, humanity and my activism to inspire others to, to stand up and, and be a support for those who, who need it. And I want to motivate um, youth to recognize their potential in the world and to, um, to be someone of note. And it doesn't have to be an international, internationally recognized noteworthiness. It can be locally and it can be still as impactful. Great. I can't think of a better place to end than there. So thank you for joining us, Aloe. I look forward to continuing the conversation and also look forward to seeing the further developments at Major Inc. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. Thanks for cheers.